All right. One more person coming in. Hold on. Just when I was about to get going. All right. They're in now, too. All right. Well, welcome to our second virtual program that we've done. I just noticed a few familiar faces and some new people on the call as well. Uh, we're glad everyone's here to hear Tyler speak about uh, some bird photography editing basics here. And um, it's been fun getting these uh, going and, and doing these virtual programs and we're getting a little bit of following with people checking all these out. Um, if you don't know about our trivia night that we've started, that's on Wednesday. So if you have a team that likes to do trivia, uh, check that out. We've got a few of the team members on there that keep winning, Kevin and Andrew are undefeated so far, is that right? Undefeated so far. So, and Stephanie. Here, and Stephanie. Oh yeah, I can't see everyone on the call. Oh yeah, and Stephanie. Yeah. Um, so if you want to try to take down the that team, join us for trivia on Wednesday night. Um, but we'll go ahead and get the program started here. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler. All right, well thank you everyone for coming out. And uh, yeah, like Rob said, we're gonna start talking about bird photo editing. So a little bit, a um, little bit of intro. We're just going to be going through a lot of the common, common adjustments that you'll see when you're looking through your basic editing software. Uh, we're going to be basing this in Photoshop and Lightroom, which are both Adobe products. And I'll go into a little bit more about how you can get them, get these programs, and uh, what some other alternatives are that don't cost as much. But just, oh, okay, there we go. A little bit of background about the importance of editing. Uh, editing photos helps to bring about a level of correction, correction that you don't necessarily get when you're in the field. You can specifically color correct and change the exposure of localized areas in the photo as opposed to the entirety of the photo at once. Um, it kind of helps set your photos apart, just give you that extra little boost to your photos if something's uh, missing or lacking. Uh, but however, it's not a substitute for not checking your settings in the field and making sure that you're careful with what you're doing there. A lot can be recovered and a lot can be done in editing, but it can't, it can't fix every problem, but it can certainly help a lot. So here's a list of the topics we're going to cover, and a lot of these may be terms that don't mean a whole lot just yet until we get going a little bit more so you can see exactly what they mean. But we'll talk about the software uh, that you can do this in and some of the best ones, my personal favorites. We'll talk about what it means to adjust the white balance of the photo, the exposure of your photo, changing the contrast, highlights, shadows, whites and blacks, the vibrance and saturation of a photo, uh, manipulating with individual color channels, sharpening and noise reduction, cropping and composition, as well as cloning and retouching photos, and then we'll go over a couple example photos uh, together at the end. So to start off with software, uh, like I said, everything that we're about to talk about here is based in the Adobe Creative Suite, and specifically in Adobe Photoshop, and Adobe Lightroom. Adobe Lightroom is a, has a camera raw editing software built into it. it, is also a very efficient catalog to help you organize your photos and keep everything in one place. Uh, Adobe Photoshop is a significantly more powerful editing tool and it has an external uh, program called Camera Raw that it uses to do your basic editing and then when you get into things more like retouching at the very end, then you can use Adobe Photoshop for that. Uh, some other programs is the Movavi is a free software, as well as if, for, if you're a Mac user, there's Apple Photo, which comes installed on your computer, can process photos, and can even handle raw photos to a certain extent. Um, there's other free ones out there, but these are the ones that I've used and I'm most familiar with and would prefer the most. Um, nothing comes close to the Adobe products, though, to me. But those are subscription-based, and they are $9.99 a month, and you get both Photoshop and Lightroom. And you will always get the most current version. They'll send you notifications whenever they're ready to be updated to the latest version. And if you need me to like restate the names of the programs at the end, uh, just let me know and I'd be happy to do so. So you're gonna hear me talking a lot about editing in RAW. And when you see your camera, <clears throat> by default, your camera's not going to be set to RAW. But that is one of the most important things you can do. Compared to a typical JPEG photo, which is what the default on all cameras is, you can record up to 256 shades of reds, blues, and greens, allowing you to get about 16 million possible colors in your photos. However, if you shoot in RAW, then you have the equivalent of 
or you have 4,096 shades of each of those colors, allowing you to get up to 68 billion colors possible in your photos. And so this is going to significantly increase the storage size of your photos. Um, oftentimes photos going from JPEG to RAW will increase five or six times, maybe even up to 10 times, depending on what camera you're using, what settings you're doing. Um, so you do have to keep in mind that the storage will fill up a lot quicker and you will have to change your cards in your camera a lot more but you have significantly more uh, data recovery. There's so much information stored in that photo that a photo in JPEG that may not even be recoverable at all, and you might have detail that's not there anymore and can never come back, can suddenly be completely corrected in RAW. And I'll show you some very extreme examples of that later on, just to kind of drive home this point. So when you open up, this is Adobe Lightroom, but specific any uh, camera RAW, editing software you use is going to show something like this. You're going to see a little graph up at the top, which is your histogram. And I'll go over that uh, here in a second. Then you're going to have your list of basic editing tools, which are exposure, contrast, highlight, shadows, whites, and blacks. The workspace is where you can see the photo that you're editing. You'll see color adjustments, and we'll go over what that looks like uh, later, as well as the camera roll at the bottom just shows you the series of all your photos. Uh, coming up so that you can quickly compare photos when you're trying to decide which one's your favorite. So that graph at the top is your histogram, and that is a graph of the tonal values of your photo. It's going to show you where the majority of each, uh, where the majority of the pixels lie. So if they're considered true blacks, if they're considered shadows, midtones, highlights, or whites of the photo, and the colors will show you what like where the percentage of the major color groups are found within this photo as well. So while this might not make sense looking at this graph directly, I'm going to show you a series of photos I took for Kevin, who's in this call. And you can see the difference here. With this, uh, with this graph skewed over to the left hand like this, you see that the photo overall is darker, and a lot of those colors are shifted to the dark side. And when you look at it, uh, where I set it to show, to show me where I've completely lost detail, where you have achieved true black in the photo and there's no color detail there anymore, that's highlighted in blue. And that shows you when the graph is skewed to the left like that, you have a lot more of that in the photo. You see in the middle, the way the colors are evenly um, distributed with greens and yellows being more on the light side. And if you look at the photo, that's what you see. Uh, the blues are shifting more to the dark side and that's a lot of the shadows in his shirt. And then when you overexpose the photo at the bottom, you see all those red spots on the right side are where the camera, where the computer's registering that as true white. Like there's no detail there anymore. And that graph is skewed over to the right hand, right hand side. And typically you want to avoid having any of that graph hitting either of those corners because that's obviously where you're going to be losing all your data without getting anything back. And so it makes sense uh, looking at this that you want to try to keep everything in the middle. And that, because that's what it looks like. The photo in the middle has all the histogram uh, combined there in the middle. And so, and that photo looks the best of all of them. But one thing you need to do is you need to just keep in mind when you're looking at uh, your photo, you know what it should look like, you know what it, you want it to look like, and every photo is gonna have a very different histogram. This photo in particular happens to have all your values kind of centered towards the middle for a nice balanced look. But if you consider these photos, uh, we just talked about trying to keep the graphs off the edges of the photos. And if you look that whiskered screech owl, is basically completely shifted to the left. But if you look closely, there's no touching on the edge there, so no data is actually being lost. But in general, it's just a darker photo without many colors to it. Whereas on the right-hand side with that snow bunting, then that's a white bird on white snow on a white sky. And since nothing's being clipped, there's no, there's no data loss there. That photo is, is exposed correctly and all the detail you need is there, but it's going to give you a histogram that looks similar to what we saw here that doesn't look good. So just considering what your subject is and how, how your background subject and colors look is really going to help you to make sure that that graph is showing you what you want to see. Mainly, you just want to make sure you don't see anything clipped off of the uh, extreme left side for blacks or the extreme right side for whites. So the next thing is auto editing. Um, Adobe Photoshop has a very nice auto edit where it will either automatically adjust the tone of the photo, the color of the photo, or the brightness of the photo. And so this uh, Willow Ptarmigan that I photographed a few years back, I took the original photo and put it there on the left, 
Then I ran it through all of Photoshop's auto processing in the middle. And then I manually edited it myself on the right. And I'm not sure what on earth is going on with that middle photo. I don't know what Photoshop was trying to do. I don't know why it thought that a, like a vintage blue look to the photo was what I wanted, but certainly not the case. Uh, so you can just see, you can see the power of knowing what you're doing and manually editing these photos yourself. No matter how tempting it is to automatically do something, you are smarter than the software. You know what you want that photo to look like and knowing how to do it will always give you a better look than what, than what the computer thinks it can do. So now we're gonna go through each of the major settings and just show, show what they are. Um, I'll show you some extremes of what they look like when you, when you mess with them, as well as some more practical uses for them that aren't necessarily as extreme. So the first is a uh, white balance. And white balance is made up by the temperature and the tint. Temperature is based on the Kelvin scale and it ranges from blue to yellow. Uh, tint is green to pink. And so you can see the center photo is the color corrected photo. The top left is the temperature skewed more towards the blue. The top right is the temperature skewed more towards the yellow. The bottom right is the tint skewed towards the green. And the bottom right is the tint skewed towards the pink. And if you look at each of the photos, except for maybe the green, every one of those photos has a certain part that is benefited by that extreme. The blues of the perula look better in the top left. The throat looks better on maybe the warms. The background in the red bud looks a lot better on the pinks but you can see it takes away from everything else. And so trying to balance that and make sure that everything looks the best it can be without taking away from anything else in the photo is key. So a little more subtle is this greater prairie chicken from Kansas a few years ago. The photo on the left was the original color as, as shot, but it was a cold cloudy morning and I, and I wanted the photo to look a little bit more warm and lively. So just increasing, increasing the temperature, um, just up 350 degrees to the right uh, towards the yellow, which is just 13. Like if you just use your arrow keys, it's 13 increments up, which is not a whole lot when you're editing. Just gave it a nice little more warm, lively feel to the photo. Uh, and then on the other hand, the tint, this Kentucky warbler uh, that Jamie and I photographed back in April. Being in uh, dense woods with green background and the light coming through the, the green leaves gave the photo an overall green feel. And that looks great for the leaves in the background and everything, and even the olive color of the bird uh, on the back. But it made the, the black, black mask and crown uh, look, look almost greenish, and I didn't want that. And it made the yellows look uh, cooler than we know that that bird was when we saw it in person. So this was a case where I had to adjust the tint much more pink than I normally would. Um, I find that tint when you're editing it is much more sensitive to change than temperature is. But you, you can see here that the bird has much more natural color. The branch has a more realistic tone to it, but you were still able to keep some of the greens and the leaves in the background there. And we're going to exposure, which is just the overall brightness and darkness of the photo. And so you can see the center photo is the exposure that I, that I wanted and I was happy with when I was finished editing the photo. Anything darker and I got a little bit more detail maybe in some of the lichens that the bird was sitting in. Uh, but if I, went, if I went too far to the right, then I started to get detail in the bird's face that I didn't have otherwise, but it was way too bright in, the, in those, that foreground. And overall, uh, you, you've got to find a balance with that as well. So here's a more subtle, uh, Subtle example than, than maybe that Lapham Longspur was. Um, this great gray owl just needed a little over one stop of expo exposure. And when you adjust that in the software, it'll go in, in increments of a third of a stop, um, which if you weren't here for the photography might not make a whole lot of sense. But when you're clicking through with your arrow keys to adjust that exposure, then you can see what it's doing uh, in real time and see, that, and see what those increments look like. So the contrast is the difference in the tones from white to gray to black. It's how, how dramatically different does the cam or does the computer register what is white and what is black. And so as you decrease that, overall, all the colors are going to sort of blend together in your photo. Whereas if you increase it more, your whites are gonna become brighter and your blacks are gonna become darker overall, which is going to give a more, 
it's a more extreme difference between the two. Um, I've also found that in many cases, it's much more noticeable to decrease your contrast by a few increments than it is to increase it by that same number of increments. Um, that is just depending on the photo itself though. So you can see a much bigger difference between the left photo and the middle photo than the middle photo and the right photo. And here's a, here's a little more uh, noticeable difference where the photo on the right looked a little, a little more contrasted than I would have liked just because of maybe lighting conditions. Whereas on the left, it's not, it's not very noticeable, but it is a nice little touch that's going to add, add a little bit overall to the photo to increase or decrease depending on what you think is necessary. So the highlights in white are how the computer is going to define what the central white spot is. And so at, the highlights will allow you to recover detail that you lose when you're editing your exposure and your whites overall. So you see that nothing really changes in the photo um, for the grass and the, the darker parts of the bird, only the bright spots on the rocks and the white on this will or this white tailed ptarmigan from Colorado. It'll sh it's only going to adjust those specific areas. And so what that looks like when you're using it to recover detail is this pelican on the left had, it was middle of the, middle of the day on a cloudy day, the sun was very bright, um, but not in the direction I was shooting. So a lot of that sky detail is lost and you can't even really see the edge of the feathers of the bird's head. But using the highlight tool, I was able to decrease that a lot and actually get some of those clouds back in the sky and add for a much more dramatic look. Um, Lowering highlights too much as well as raising shadows too much, which we'll see in a second, also leads to a significant um, decrease in the contrast of your photo. So that is one thing to bear in mind when you're doing this. So on the other hand, the shadows and blacks are going to be how the computer defines the central black spot of the photo. And similar to how the highlights were allowing you to recover detail in those very bright areas, shadows are gonna allow you to recover detail specifically in the dark areas of the photo. So the parasitic Jaeger in the middle is, was able to get as much detail as I could while still maintaining the overall dark look that the bird had. And you see on the left that the snow and the background weren't really changed in the, the brightness of it overall, but all the shadows in the grass and the shadows in the bird itself became much brighter. And on the, on the far right side, then the bird got a, a lot darker overall. And so did those shadows, but the background again remains the same. And so that can be useful if you're shooting against a, a bright background and you have a bright bird, such as this broad-tailed hummingbird, that had some white in the throat. And if I were to raise the exposure overall, then I'm going to completely lose all detail in that background. I might even start to lose detail in the bird's uh, chest. And, and instead of doing that, specifically raising the shadows alone was allowing me to bring back that data in the bird itself without losing anything else. Again, like I said, with highlights, this will lead to an overall decrease in contrast of the photo. So that, so again, just bear that in mind when you're doing this and make sure that the, make sure the photo still has the overall look that you want if you're looking at one specific area when you're doing this. So vibrance and saturation. Uh, overall saturation intensifies or decreases all the colors across the photo. If something's de truly desaturated, it's a black and white photo. Vibrance is a tool that Adobe just released not too long ago and a lot of other raw softwares have added since then. And it's a, a computer powered smart tool that is going to register what the most intense colors are in the photo and it's gonna leave those alone. So it's gonna allow you to specifically focus on the muted colors in the photo. And I find that to be mostly useful with skin tones because if you overall saturate a photo when you're photographing people, then their skin's going to turn an unnatural orangey red color that you don't really want. Whereas when you use vibrance, you can maybe emphasize the colors of their clothes or the setting that they're in. Um, but with birds, specifically like this Baltimore Oriole, it allows us to adjust the flowers and the greenery and the background color without making the bird an unnatural glowing orange. Although Baltimore Orioles are already glowing orange to a certain extent. So here's the difference between desat like saturation on the bottom, again, totally desaturated as black and white. Um, Bar on the right is a little too much color to even process what's going on at first. It's very bright. But you see if we decrease the vibrance all the way, we lose all those muted background colors and a lot of the greenery. But the orange of the bird still stays and some of the green, some of the brightest green points in those leaves. And when you increase the vibrance all the way, the bird still looks a natural orange, 
um, but your greens are going to get a lot more vibrant. And again, doing this, uh, if you're looking at one specific thing you want to emphasize and you do this too much, make sure you go back and look at the photo overall in general to make sure that you haven't done too much otherwise. Um, specifically in this case, in the, the photo at max vibrancy, the flowers look very nice. The yellows in the flower, um, the yellows in the center of the flower, the buds on them and everything look great. But then if you look at that series of leaves in the top left corner, those are almost a neon green and don't look like any color we would see naturally uh, in the setting that this bird was photographed. So now when we get in specifically to editing color channels, this can be beneficial when you're working with stuff that vibrancy and saturation can't quite uh, do. So it'll allow you to manipulate individual colors. And so you can see uh, a series of colors listed on the right that have something that says hue, saturation, and luminance to it. And com like you don't commonly manipulate the bird with this, but it helps a lot when you're adjusting with the foreground and uh, or when you're adjusting with the setting of the bird. So hue is going to adjust the, the color that that represents. So something like red, you can make it look more orange or more pink. You can make all colors in the photo that are considered red like that. You can saturate and desaturate uh, individual colors and you can change luminance or brightness of each one. So you can make it so specifically the blues in a photo look brighter. And so I have an example. So here's the original of this uh, Pacific Loon from Barrow. And when you lighten up the blues, then the, uh, then the water gets brighter and nothing else changes on the photo. And when you change the blue hue, then it turns to this unnatural purple water. We can totally desaturate the blues and now the bird's swimming in gray water. It almost looks like ink. And then if we maximize the blues, then you have a very unnatural blue, but again, no other colors in the photo are being affected by this. And so one time, so I said that you don't typically use this to adjust birds, but sometimes when you're working in really funky conditions, you can get uh, instances like this where these birds may look, these photos may look relatively similar at first glance, but I went in specifically desaturated all the purples and all the blues from the photo. And you can see that a lot more when I blow up the heads, how purple the blacks of that bird looks. And sometimes you'll get that where the bird just doesn't quite look the color you're looking or one specific thing doesn't look. Like in this case, it was just the, the darkest points of this black pole warbler. And when we were able to decrease the purples and the blues specifically, then it's gonna give us that overall black and white color that we know black pole warblers are. And some of that is just an artifact of blowing up a photo that was uh, a little further away than I would have liked, having to crop it a little bit more. The computer doesn't really know how to process that um, because it was it was so far away that I'm not working with near as much resolution anymore. So sharpening and noise reduction um, is one of the, it's one of those things that are very very noticeable if done too much. Um, it's the amount of noise present in your photo and how to smooth it out because to an extent adding noise to a photo is going to allow you to get the sense that there's more detail present there. And it's going to allow something like close-ups of feathers to look even more um, sharp and everything. But then if you look at it overall, you're going to see a lot more noise in your background, similar to if you would increase the ISO on your camera a little bit more. And so luminance in this case is going to be smoothing that out. It's your noise reduction. And sometimes it's hard uh, to find that balance of difference between detail and feathers and a lack of noise in the background. And so when you're when you're faced with this, uh, I know Photoshop and Lightroom have a tool that under the sharpening panel that they call masking. And if you if you use that, then you're going to see this little photo in the bottom left, your photo is going to go black and white and look uh, kind of creepy like this. And as you adjust that fader like that, it's going to adjust it where anything that's white in the photo is where it's going to apply sharpening. It's not going to apply sharpening to anything in the black. And as you move that uh, more towards the right, you're telling it that you want to apply sharpening to less and less space. So that black is going to increase. So you can use that to specifically um, increase the sharpness on the bird. And in this case, we know where we're getting it as opposed to just adding a bunch of noise overall to our background. So up close, you can see, if you look at the top, um, it's going to be a close-up of the eye of this red phalarope. rope. And then if you look at the bottom, it's the full headshot. And the full headshot might not look much different 
in each one. Um, and if you look at the little insets there, you can see that the the background looks a lot the background looks a lot nicer on that furthest left photo than it does on the furthest right. However, when you look up at that close up of the eye, there's a lot less detail around there. Whereas on the right, the bird may look the most detailed on the far right, but the background doesn't look near as good in the bottom right. So again, it's it's difficult to find this balance. And if we'd used the masking tool in this, we were, we'd be able to isolate just the bird and not even really have to worry about applying Sharpen to this. And there's some new programs that are being released right now that are able to do this incredible. Like they're, they're incredible how they work, but they're, they're specifically for this task right here. So then uh, once we've adjusted all the settings of the photo, then it's time to crop it. Um, and sometimes people like to crop at the beginning, some like to crop at the end. And this is what this is really what can add and make your photo look more appealing. And one thing to consider is often with birds, you'll hear hear people say, make sure you give the bird room to fly. And what, what we mean by that is if a bird's perched on a stick, you're gonna want to crop it with more room in the direction that bird's facing. So that essentially if it were to fly away, it wouldn't hit the edge of your photo right away right away. You can see in the bottom left though, uh, of these great Kiss Kitty series, that the photo, the bird's awfully far set to the right. It looks a little awkward uh, compared to the middle, but there's still more, more room on the left side of the bird, giving it that room to fly. Whereas on the far right, the bird's right facing up against the edge of the photo, and all that room is behind it. And it, it looks awkward. The bird looks cramped in that photo. Um, but then on the other hand of that, then you have the opportunity for things like headshots, where maybe a square, crop, a square composition where the bird is right in the middle is the best way to go. And so you'll see these lines when you're cropping a photo, and these are guidelines for the rule of thirds. And the rule of thirds is a general, a general rule that you have, you have these series of nine squares, and the lines dividing them and the, the points where all, all four lines come together are considered to be where you want to put your subject. So in the case of the screen J on the far left, having the bird, the center of that bird going through that line gives it the most appealing area. Those four points, um, I only you're able to see the mouse, but right here on the corners of all four, or all four corners of the center square of this grid are considered to be the four points where your eye is drawn first in the photo. So you want to put your subject there, whether it's uh, whether the bird is going through that line between those two points, if the bird is smaller in the frame and you want to put the bird right on that point, or if you're close enough to the bird and you're able to get the eye of the bird, such as this Canada J on the far right, if you're able to get the eye right on that PowerPoint then that's going to allow for a much more appealing photo um, and it's something that you don't really even think about your, your eyes just go to that point right away another thing that is I, I commonly see in photos when i'm looking through them are people will crop the photo they'll make it look really great and something just looks off they'll have the composition very nice but again something just doesn't look right and sometimes that's that's the level of the photo so you see here, um, both of these long-tailed duck photos look fine. Like they're, they're cropped well, the coloring and the lighting looks, looks good. But that bird on the left is slightly tilted downward. And that can be a result of just me not holding my camera perfectly level when I'm photographing. And that's difficult to do every time. So all I have to do is when I'm using the crop tool, you get the option to rotate it just a little bit. And all, all your little grid lines are going to get even more fine. And you can use that to level your photo. So I have the yellow line is where the bird is, is where the bird is. And, uh, and then, yeah, so I have it. So the yellow line in each photo is where I move the bird to uh, versus compared, or yeah, compared to how it was in the other photo. So you can just see the difference. It's not much of an angle there, but it's just enough to give a totally different feel to the photo and make the bird, make the bird look more alive and realistic because it's right there at eye level, flat in front of you. It's a very subtle thing, but it goes a long way when you're editing photos, is to consider, consider, especially with water, if you have ripples in the water, those are a great way to, to adjust and use those as points to, uh, to adjust the leveling of your photo. Uh, I just wanted to give a couple other examples of ways you can compose photos, whether it's centering a bird that's doing something specific and there's not much going else in the photo, that your eye gets drawn right there, and both of those wings are gonna go through those, uh, those grid lines are the rule of thirds. You can center, if you have multiple birds and you center those in the photo, then 
the two heads of those green jays are within that center box, so your eye is drawn to that area. You have you have something like this scrub jay where the beak and the dragonfly that's in his beak are on one of those power points as well. To things like headshots of this royal turn or making the snowy plover very tiny in the frame and keeping him on one of those power points as well. Or even having an in-flight shot of, of a Jaeger and making sure this long-tailed Jaeger and making sure that he has room to, to fly in the direction that he's facing. So they're all, again, they're all things that can go a long way uh, when you pay attention to them while editing photos. One of the most difficult uh, tasks is cloning and retouching and often, or I shouldn't say oftentimes, all the time, it's better to make sure you do this right in the field. If there's a branch in the way of the bird that you can avoid when you're photographing it, take that extra step over to, the, to get out of the way of that branch because it's a lot easier to do that and take the photo again than it is to get it out in Photoshop, but it can be done. And so Lightroom has a tool for this and it's good for easy to see things that are in very, uh, or they're in areas with very little um, detail, such as like a stick in the water or some like a spot in the sky if a bug flies, flies by and you get this little blurry fly going through. It's easy to get that stuff out, but, but Lightroom's tool is not very good if you were to try to photograph a branch or Photoshop a branch out of the, out of the way of the bird. That's when you're actually going to want to use Adobe Photoshop software. And so you can see the difference here is just, there was a, a, there was a power line running through the back of this long tailed duck photo. Lightroom's tool was able to quickly just get that out. It was, it's against a bright white background. There's not really any other detail or pull from. Um, but this uh, grass that was going through the eye of the seaside sparrow was, it's an extreme case. And in many times I wouldn't take the time to do something like this because I would rather just reshoot the photo because if you can't see it, then there's no detail there and you have to tell Photoshop what you want it to look like. And oftentimes you have to do what we call cloning, which is where you can choose a point in the photo to pull from and Photoshop will draw in something that looks like that. Sometimes you have to manually draw it yourself. Um, it takes a long time and if you're really, if you're really desperate or it's something really simple, it can be done. But again, many times it's best to just uh, take extra precaution when you're in the field shooting. So here's an example of when I was saying Adobe Lightrooms is able to easily get little blurry sticks out of water. Um, you can see the difference in the water from the top and bottom of this King Eider photo on the left. Um, top right photo is zoomed in on the area just left of the bird and you can see all those little sticks. All the little spots that you can see on the screen in the bottom right are areas where I where I highlighted and told Lightroom, there's something here, I don't want this here. And then it used, it used its, uh, it used its software and was able to pick what it thought the area around looked like and what therefore that area that I was highlighting should actually look like if that object wasn't there. And then you can go in and manually correct it if it's not right. And many times that uh, sort of thing is right when you're just trying to get a little spot out of the water. Um, but occasionally it'll pull from the wrong spot and you can move it yourself. But again, it, it just adds an overall cleaner look to the photo and can be less distracting. So here's just a couple extreme cases of just what the power of editing can do. Um, if you're shooting midday like this Louisiana water thrush, this was well later into the morning than I would typically like to be uh, trying to shoot. The lighting was getting a little harsh. You can see some highlights in the moss. Uh, the bird was shadowed. But with a, a little bit of extra time, I was able to brighten the bird up without losing too much detail in the moss and not make the bird look as dark as it does on the left. Um, the broad-billed hummingbird in the bottom left is another extreme example where shooting in RAW was able to keep so much of that detail there that otherwise would have been lost in JPEG. Anything in the wings, tail, and the throat of that bird would have been so dark you wouldn't have been able to recover that normally. But because RAW saves all that information, you're able to do that. So now I wanna start with this photo and we're just gonna go through and show you what it looks like when you apply all of this to one photo. So here's our original. And the first two things I did was I just increased the exposure and I was able to adjust the highlights. I just decreased them a little bit. And so just raising the exposure up one uh, stop and a quarter there and then decreasing the highlights a lot just to get some of that detail back in the bird. Um, this photo didn't have a whole lot of highlights other than the face of this prothonotary warbler. So decreasing that didn't really affect a whole lot other than gave me some more room to work with in the face. 
Now, using that highlight decrease as our reference on the left, I was able to lift the shadows a little bit and get some more detail back in the, the bark of this log that he was sitting in, uh, maybe a little more detail around the beak and then the eye, which is nice. And then I still wasn't quite content with the exposure, so I raised it just a little bit more overall. Since my highlights were decreased, I could increase the exposure and not, and not worry about making that area too bright. Again, using that last step as our reference now, I lifted the shadows just a tad bit more to get a little bit more out of the bark and in the eyes and everything. But the photo looked a little yellow to me. The greens, the greens looked a little more uh, olivey and warm than I, re than I really wanted them to be. So I was able to take the temperature 12 increments towards the blue. And that overall made the greens look better. It made the, the wings of the bird look better and it made the prothonotary look a more vibrant yellow and less orange than it did before. Then I raised the exposure just a tad bit more because I wanted a little more detail in those bright or in those dark areas without losing any of the bright areas. Um, I noticed the photo was still a little yellow in the background for my liking, so I was able to turn the temperature 10 more increments towards the blue and was able to get some color that I was finally happy with. Um, specifically in the bark, the photo looked a little contrasty still, so I overall just decreased the contrast by 18 and was left with this. So here's uh, the original versus the final when, when we did these, uh, these steps here. And it shows that it, the prothonotary looked, looked fine from the beginning. It was a nice sharp photo. The bird was close. It put on quite a show for Jamie and I. Um, but once I went through and I edited the photo, it just it has an extra nice, vibrant, lively, realistic look to it. I think it overall just makes the photo look a lot better. So then I want to run through one more example that uses a little bit more tools uh, than the prothonotary did. So we have this original photo of the redneck fowler oak. Uh, this was taken up on our barrow tour last summer. And the, like, right away, the photo, again, the photo looks fine. The bird is, the bird's visible. There's not much else going on to distract you from him. He's relatively uh, close and you can see a lot of detail, but I think we can do better here. So the first thing I did was, I just wanted to cool it down a little bit. Um, also, I, I liked the color of the water and I kind of wanted to emphasize that a little bit. If I made the photo just a tad bit more blue, then I wasn't going to have to uh, sacrifice a whole lot in the bird because he's overall a cool colored bird except for that red. Just gonna lift the exposure a tad bit and get some more detail uh, in the bird. The water was looking a little dark in some areas as well. So, what you'll see is on the left will be the last step we just did, and then on the right will be the new step. So I decreased the contrast just a little bit. Um, it helped out in areas like the tail and some of the water reflection and the back of the neck there, that darker area. Then I lifted the shadows a little bit more just to get detail back in those areas without making that uh, neck any brighter than I wanted it to be um, because we were pushing some pretty white area there, and I don't really want to make it any more and lose any detail. Then this is how I decided to crop the photo. And so you'll see the last step uh, versus how we have the photo cropped now. And then I'm gonna rotate it. The yellow line is, how, is the direction the bird was facing in the original photo. Uh, the red line is, where, is now where the bird rests and the yellow line shows where it was before. And you can see that is a, uh, again, it's not a very big angle, but it makes quite a difference when you're comparing those. Then uh, I just noticed a couple little spots on the left side of the photo um, and then a couple just behind the bird. And I used Lightroom's quick little uh, spot heel clone tool and was able to remove those really easily. Again, because it's a very simple background, there wasn't much detail there and it didn't really have anything to confuse it with when it was trying to figure out what it should look like in general. So then we start with this photo and a simple little temperature change, exposure adjustment, contrast and shadows, but with some cropping, rotating, and some cloning and retouching of dirt, we're left with this. And so it's quite a nice uh, difference between the two. The original may have been nice, but we were able to give it that extra, extra look there at the end and just make it all around a cleaner, more lively photo. And again, like I said this during the photography presentation for those who were there, you were there in front of this bird. You got to watch this bird in real time. You know what the bird should look like. You know what the setting looked like. And if you didn't quite capture that on camera, now's your time to really show people what you saw. If the camera didn't quite do something how you were thinking, you can adjust it 
and editing to really show people what you want to show them here. Editing, editing is uh, an art in itself and it will allow you to do some pretty amazing things to photos. So that being said, I wanted to adjust, uh, address something new that we're offering. Um, for anyone who's still a little overwhelmed by this and doesn't quite understand everything and wants some help with their photos, we're now offering a service where, and we'll have more information coming out soon, where if you send in photos um, for a small price, we, we will we'll run through, we'll do all this editing, and I will record an annotated video of me doing all the edits and explaining what I'm doing specifically for your photo, why I'm doing it, how to do it, and then giving you that final photo as well as this video for you to reference and then in use for all of your future photos. And so just in case anyone's wondering what that looks like, um, I have a little one minute clip from a sample video of this redneck power up, just so you can see how my, my computer clicks are tracked and you're able to see specifically what I'm doing with text explaining it overall. Um, and this is just showing in real time what each of those slides when I was going through the redneck power up would actually look like to be doing it. So we'll just, uh, we'll watch this and you'll be able to see, see what we're doing here. So this is just using Photoshop's clone tool to remove some of those spots that I wasn't really happy with a little, I think they were, there were insects sitting on the water that the fowler was hunting for, but they were a little distracting to me. I kind of noticed them right away when I was looking at the photo. There's still a little bit more I'm going through and just, just retouching some of the edges there that I didn't, uh, that I wasn't quite happy with. And so this is the end of the video. You can see where we went from that original photo to this final here. And so this is something new um, that we're, we're working on just if people are interested in this. Um, if not, if you have specific editing questions, feel free to reach out and I'll make sure that these questions are uh, forwarded to me in general. So with that, I want to open it up to if anyone has any questions. And here's one more extreme case of saving a photo from RAW. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute and ask. Doesn't, doesn't seem like there's any any questions now. Um, yeah, again, feel free Tyler, to reach out. Oh, yeah. Tyler, I actually have a question. I get this yeah. question a lot. Um, when people are starting out, do you think it's easier for them to start in Lightroom or to just jump into Photoshop? Yeah, and I know we we're we we're talking about this. Um, I think if you're just starting out and this whole editing thing is going to be new to you, I highly, highly suggest starting with Lightroom. Um, if nothing else, Lightroom is a fantastic catalog for organizing your photos and the one thing I really like um, especially for your, for people who are just starting and I was able to use this actually a lot when making this presentation and digging out old photos is Lightroom will actually keep track of all the edits you've ever done and it writes them to a separate file so if I went back to this like this white breasted nut hatch photo here if I went back to this photo right now in Lightroom I think I took this photo five years ago maybe I'd be able to go back and see all my edits that I did and I could even go back and undo them and redo them. I could recrop the photo. It saves all the original information. And so I highly recommend Lightroom for that. Um, if you have a large catalog and you have your photos organized in a way that you like and you're, you're comfortable with that, you don't want to make the change to move them all and reorganize them in the software, then I think doing individual photos in, in Photoshop would be just as fine. You can open up a series of photos and edit them and then send them into the actual software itself. Um, Lightroom is also great for editing large numbers of photos. Um, if you have an entire series and you want to do an edit to one photo and then you know that the settings will apply to all your other photos if it was a burst and you're happy with the entire series, you can highlight all the photos and apply that one edit to all the photos and get them all done a lot quicker that way. All right, any other questions? I don't think there are. All right, well, thanks again, everyone, for, for coming out. Um, I will say Paul just sent oh, me a message, but uh, I was gonna say this for the end. Everything has been recorded and we are planning on putting these on our website.
Um, so it'll take a little bit to get them all set how we want to, um, but we will post on social media uh, when we have those all saved uh, onto our site so you can watch them at any time and, and uh, remember what Tyler was talking about because it's a lot, a lot to learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Tyler, thanks for another wonderful program. And uh, we really appreciate it.